It's been refreshing to see how the discourse has changed on Israel-Palestine and how, I guess, the widely available clips on things like social media of Israeli brutality to Palestinians in Gaza and East Jerusalem and the West Bank has now, you know, helped, I feel like, change public opinion irreversibly. And this has also spread to celebrities both feeling more, I guess, emboldened to speak up and also a lot of them to change their perspectives. Now, today I want to talk about Seth Rogen and his evolution from someone who was quite a big Israeli supporter back in 2014 during the invasion of Gaza to now being someone who calls out right-wing Zionists who are trying to muddy the waters and act like Israel can do no wrong. And now, Seth Rogen isn't, like, the best person at calling out Israel. I've actually found it quite hard to find any public statements on the recent controversy between them. But what he has been good at doing is basically making sure criticism of Israel isn't wrongly conflated with anti-Semitism, especially with some, you know, really bad faith actors on the right who try to smear constantly people like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar as these people who are racist against Jews when they are simply criticizing the Israeli state. I'm going to plug my social media and Patreon for about a minute. If you don't care about that stuff, please skip. But before we get any further, a lot of my work on this channel is demonetized because when you're covering more serious, sometimes edgier topics, YouTube doesn't like this. So if you've ever enjoyed my work, please consider becoming a patron. And you don't have to pledge a crazy amount. I want to build up my Patreon based on as many people as possible pledging little amounts, like a dollar or two. So if, you know, you feel like I have ever brought anything that's worthwhile into your life and my content, please really consider becoming a patron to help me continue to do this, regardless of if YouTube monetize or not most of my videos in a given month. Also, if you want to join our communities, come check out our Discord and my subreddit. Those links in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, please check out the Cavernacle at Twitter, at Instagram, and also my personal Reddit where you can keep up to date with all my content and what I'm doing. Now, I don't know when this video is going up. I'm going away on holiday in a couple weeks. So this is one of the videos I have prepared. So thank you so much for 35k. Hopefully, before you've watched this one, I actually have another chocolate orange to mark the occasion. For every 5k, we get a new chocolate orange. Please help me hit 40k by the end of the year, and we can have, you know, two new chocolate oranges from this video. On the week this video goes up, I won't be live streaming, but usually I live stream on a Tuesday and Thursday night, and I archive the streams on the Cavernacle Extra, so subscribe to my second channel if you care about that stuff. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, Rogan used to be a big Israel supporter, and we're going to get a bit more into his background a bit later. But just a report from the Jerusalem Post during Israel's invasion of Gaza in 2014. Seth Rogen, Schwarzenegger, joined hundreds of Hollywood heavies in support of Israel. This also included the entertainers, included also Bill Maher, Sarah Silverman, Justin Bieber's manager, Scooter Braun, and director, Ivan Ritman. And they've signed a statement written by the Creative Community for Peace, an organization of prominent entertainment industry executives devoted to using art and music to build bridges for peace that comes down squarely on Israel's side in the conflict. So basically a pro-Israeli thing. So they released a statement and it says it expresses the support for Israel's rights to defend itself against Hamas, as well as empathy for the loss of all innocent lives. And it's running an advertisement in major industry publications, including Variety and The Hollywood Reporter. And it says, Hamas cannot be allowed to rain rockets on Israeli cities, nor can people be allowed to hold its own people hostage. Hospitals are for healing, not for hiding weapons. Schools are for learning, not, not for launching missiles. Children are hope, not our human shields. Reads a statement signed by the entertainers, according to CCFP's co-founder and chairman, David Renzer. The campaign rapidly took off as the organization's advisory board began reaching out to friends and associates, and they said, We are heartened to have received such enormous response from within the industry, from artists to producers, agents, attorneys, managers, industry executives, which is gratifying, especially as we witness the disturbing growth of anti-Semitism around the world. We fully expect the list of signatories to continue to grow. Steve Schnur, president of the EA Music Group and a co-founder of this organization, also said, We and all our friends in Hollywood hope for a speedy end to the conflict so that artists can resume to travel to Israel 
and see for themselves the country's thriving democracy, its rich culture, and its people's profound desire for peace, once again allowing the power of art and music to bring people together. Now, just to talk about how much the conversation has shifted on Israel, imagine this coming out today from all these famous celebrities, where it basically blames the Palestinians for their own oppression. And it talks about like Hamas, like they're holding Gaza hostage and Israel, the ones to free them. No, Hamas have gained popularity because of the constant oppression of the Palestinians and the belief in many Palestinian circles in Gaza that the PLO had sold them out to the Israelis and the West and attacking them more and brutalizing Palestinians more only adds their support including until today as well. And also we've seen this narrative about weapons and Hamas fighters hiding in plain sight, like in schools and hospitals. And of course, recently, the Associated Press building apparently had them hidden. It's just a convenient excuse Israel like to use to bomb Gaza positions and Gaza's infrastructure. Now, about a year ago, Seth Rogen got into loads of controversy because he started talking about Israel more frankly after he'd been exposed to, I guess, more realistic debates around them and learning about the real history of Israel. So he went on Mark Moran podcast and he spoke quite frankly about these things. These are two Jewish guys. And Rogan said about Israel, I don't understand it. To me, it just seems like an antiquated thought process. If it's for religious reasons, I don't agree with it because I think religion is silly. If it is truly for the preservation of Jewish people, it makes no sense. Because again, you don't keep something you're trying to preserve all in one place, especially when the place has been proven to be pretty volatile. I'm trying to keep all these things safe. I'm going to put them in my blender and hope that that's the best place that will do it. This doesn't make sense to me. And he went on to say, I also think that as a Jewish person, I was fed a huge amount of lies about Israel my entire life. They never tell you that, oh, by the way, there are people there they make it seem like it was just sitting there and the door was open. Now, this agency called the Jewish Agency actually reached out to Rogan's mum to talk about his comments and trying to get him to apologise. Now, Rogan actually had a Zoom conversation with the guy who heads the organisation. He's called Isaac Herzog, who's actually the son of a former Israeli prime minister. So it's an organisation that is deeply tied to the Israeli state. Now, he came out of a statement and said that Rogan had taken back all his comments and he had basically apologised for both of them, both the one talking about Israel, you know, it makes more sense to spread out Jews around the world, and of course that he wasn't taught about Israeli history properly, in that he was just taught that it was this big desert that the Jews just went to after World War II and set up a country. Sorry about the quality of these screenshots, just because I had to take them from an older video because the Haaretz article is now under a paywall. But um, he talked to Haaretz, which is a Jewish Israeli outlet, about this controversy. So in a Zoom interview with Haaretz on Sunday, discussing everything from the podcast controversy to his new film, Anti-Semitism and Yes Pickles, Rogan did not use the word apologise or I'm sorry. He said repeatedly he was sensitive to those who'd been offended when reading reports of his remarks. He went on to say, things I said were taken and chopped up and the context literally removed from it. And if I read some of those things out of context, I'd probably be upset too. Rogan describes himself as a proud Jew and discussed speaking out against anti-Semitism, including when it happened on his home turf of Hollywood. He was equally outspoken about politics and the recent BLM protests, saying that no part of me was questioning why people were as angry as they were. So some important context that Rogan went to like Hebrew school when he went to some Hebrew summer camps and stuff. And that's where he was taught about Israel. So the Haaretz interview asks and says, there was just an abandoned desert here and the Jews came and built a country. That's what you were told. And Rogan says, essentially, yeah, that's what me and many people I know were told. And again, all I'm attacking there is the education I was given about it. And I talked to my parents about it actually just yesterday. And I was like, do you feel what we were given was a complete story? And they said, no, looking back at the time, you were given a less complex view of the situation than maybe you could have given. And the next question says, I listened to another podcast you did and it sounded like you felt oppressed and misunderstood in Jewish day school and then liberated and free in high school. And he says, it was not a diverse school at all. It was where little white Jewish kids whose parents were all friends with each other. And it was very enclosed. And then I got to public high school and I could dress however I wanted. There were kids from all different backgrounds and races. My school was 65 to 70% people from Asian backgrounds, especially being from Vancouver, which is so heavily populated by people from Asian countries. It was wonderful and eye-opening experience to get to become friends of the people and spend the whole day of people that I lived among. So Rogan's comments there are perfectly fair. If you're not taught the history of a country, it's no wonder he supported them in 2014. So it's not just Israel as a settler colonial country 
which has a problem with actually telling its history properly. The UK is one. Canada is another one. We're recently seeing how badly the history has been taught with all these discoveries of these mass graves of indigenous children. And then, of course, you have America's own settler colonial past, which you're not taught about at all. You're not taught about the Hawaiian natives and royal family. You're not even taught sometimes what happened to the Native Americans. There are some textbooks that said that the Native Americans taught the settlers their ways and how to farm and then left. Doesn't talk about what actually happened to them. Skips over what happened to African Americans and Jim Crow and going back to slavery. And of course, there's this massive war on woke history and critical race theory, basically saying it's teaching children to hate themselves by trying to educate themselves on the real founding of America. And then if you take that to Britain, Britain is of course complicit in some regard to the founding ideologies of like America, Canada and Australia. But even in the context of the British Isles, we're not really taught about Northern Ireland in the UK. You're not taught about who William of Orange was. You're not taught about what Oliver Cromwell did. In terms of Ireland specifically, which of course has, you know, a settler colonial state in Northern Ireland still existing today, people in the UK are not taught about that stuff. And that's how you can weaponize stuff like IRA sympathizer at Jeremy Corbyn because he worked on the peace process in Northern Ireland. Because that's how ignorant we all are. And Israel is probably exactly the same. And I'm sure lots of people who either grow up in Israel or Jewish communities and they go to Jewish schools that promote Israel because, of course, not all Jewish communities like Israel. There are certain subsections of Judaism which are actually firmly against the state of Israel on religious grounds. But if you go to one of these schools, it'll probably whitewash the history as well because the history is pretty awful, whether that is 1948 and the war there, whether that is just various incidents that have gone on between the wars, whether it's 1967 and the massive expansion of Israeli territory and the brutal conflict there, whether that's the wars in the 80s and conflicts with Lebanon and everything. It's a very brutal and horrible history. And of course, what's going on right now is like a through line from that stuff. And Israel has firmly become like a hard right wing country with Netanyahu and of course, the new prime minister now, it's buying into this ideology that believes Israel is a state primarily just for Jewish people. And not all Zionists believe that. Some Zionists believe Israel should be a state that of course is based on Judaism, but is more inclusive. It's like liberal forms of Zionism that someone like Natalie Portman might believe in. Whereas the people now feel like the whole territory around the area belongs to Israel, belongs to the Jews. It's this right wing, far right Zionism that has been taken over. But I'm glad we touched on this because now we're going to talk about far right Zionists. People who believe any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, who will go to great lengths to justify any Israeli violence. Now, one of these people is called Eve Barlow. Now, there's been a joke going around because she's such like a horrible uh, person. People have been calling her Eve Fartlow. And then she wrote an article calling this a social media pogrom. Because when you're a massive fighter against anti-Semitism in all forms, you're going to call a fart joke the same thing as a pogrom. This disgusting thing that has constantly and reoccurringly happened to Jewish communities throughout the world. And, you know, even after World War II, people who survived the Holocaust would come home in Poland, for example, and then be killed by the Polish people there in a pogrom. So comparing a social media joke calling you fart low to that is, in my mind, totally disgusting. But let's see how she justifies it. So here's her stupid article. I'll read some of it. I don't know who crafted the first tweet that simply said Eve fart low, but whoever it was, bottle human, started a fire. Over the past two weeks, Twitter has been littered with the words Eve fart low. Every time I tweet, this title is the response I retract, and it's pelted at me irrespective of what I write. Hundreds of trolls, some with blue ticks and some without. Just start responding to me, Eve Fartlow. If we donated a JNF tree to Israel for every time someone tweeted Eve Fartlow, there'd be no Negev left. Due to the juvenile nature of the Fartlow attack, which sounds like it was invented by a three-year-old on Pop-Tarts, I wondered if the bombardment of Eve Fartlow tweets was in engineered to drive me insane. Perhaps it was a form of digital waterboarding aimed at forcing me to surrender, delete all my accounts, log out of my devices, and commit digital suicide. Eve Fartlow is not my name, regardless of how many thousands of times it's echoed back to me by trolls online. The seeds of this pogrom have been sown for a while. 
Online, there are different degrees of erasure and inclusion. First comes the unfollow, which hurts, especially from those we consider friends, those we love and cherish, whose memories are still fresh. Sometimes an unfollow is a result of pressure from online users who dox people they disagree with. Sometimes an unfollow is a decision taken with complete autonomy, someone deciding to simply delete a person from their timeline rather than ask for clarification or, God forbid, pursue a fair-minded discussion. So this just seems like she's butt hurt. A lot of people have turned around and hated her for how right-wing she is in her Zionism. But then Seth Rogen just responds for, with like a wind emoji, pretty much saying, you know, that she is still fart low. Now, people have been getting really mad. Now I want to talk about how Seth Rogen has been good, despite not really calling out Israel that much, in countering the right-wing narrative on Israel. So Eve Fartlow also tweeted, my Jewish friend saw a sign that said free parking and panicked that it said free Palestine. The Jews are tired. That would be the worst thing ever, wouldn't it? Free Palestine, because, you know, they're being oppressed and the ones who live in Gaza essentially live in an open air prison, according to the UN. Ashley Feinberg tweeted, generally devastated to have been blocked mere hours after I learned about the greatest account. And then Seth Rogen said, this is how I feel being blocked by Poserbeck, who's that you know far right Trump supporter. Then someone else started tweeting, I wonder if Seth Rogen says to himself every day, nice job, I've made sure that every Jew on social media is continually harassed by anti-Semites with fart jokes, now that's funny. Michael Dixon is someone who's fighting with Seth Rogen a lot, says, yes, he probably does, quite the record of achievement. And Seth Rogen says, I mean, with a name like Dixon, you should probably sit this one out. And Michael Dixon is the executive director at Stand With Israel. And he kept tweeting Seth Rogen, who says, you're just ignoring me so much, you can't stop tweeting me. Someone else says, Seth, any chance you might rethink what you're doing here? So many Jewish people are subjected to hate. We need voices of support, but your voice is doing the opposite of that. And he says, I mean, this man tagged me in a tweet talking shit about me, so I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. So Eve Barlow went on Fox News to talk about all this bullshit she was saying. And someone said, kudos to Eve Barlow for the courage of getting on national television, looking the camera in the eye and saying what this is all about. The fight for the right to be openly Jewish and proud. Seth Rogen says, nothing better than supporting the mouthpiece of white supremacy to help the Jews. Someone saying, Seth, dude, Jews are under attack around the world. Let's not busily attack one another. And he says, is Eve not doing that, you hypocrite? And then Ethan says, I'm asking for us to not attack each other, that's all. Like Eve is doing to me on Fox News, says Seth Rogen. Seth, I love you. I've interviewed you and I'm a huge fan of your work. You have a massive following and can lead by example on how we disagree with each other without attacking each other. And Seth Rogen just tweeted this picture of Eve Fartlow saying all this stuff about him. So now he clarifies why he's been mocking her. So someone says... You should apologize to the girl you mock for being concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism. And he says, I mock someone downplaying violence against Jews by comparing fart jokes to genocide. I'm terrified and appalled at the rise of anti-Semitism. Now, he's also calling out the spectator who is promoting this stuff. So Michael Dixon says, excellent article by Dominic Green by The Spectator. Unlikely to appeal to Seth Rogen since there are no pictures. But so maybe someone can explain it to him. And Seth Rogen says... No better publication to speak on what's good for Jews than, than one that literally published an article defending Nazis. And The Spectator had an in praise of the Wehrmacht article. Michael Dixon says, Great attempt at deflection, Seth Rogen, but this is about you joining an anti-Semitic misogynist pylon of Jewish journalist Eve Barlow. So are you proud of that or would you like to apologise to her? So this guy's completely avoiding it as well by not talking about The Spectator. And then Seth Rogen has another picture of The Spectator that says, Tacky, a fascist takeover of Greece, we should be so lucky. And he says, it's a deflection to point out that a publication that has a history of writing pro-Nazi articles probably isn't the best voice to amplify if your best interests are with Jews. They've done it more than one time. Seth, you happily quoted plenty of questionable publications in the past. That said, you think it's cool to pick on a woman who's facing a deluge of anti-Semitism and hate. What a brave man you are. And he says, which ones? I'd love to see some examples. Someone else saying, you're deflecting. Why did you join in the bullying of a female journalist who speaks out against anti-Semitism? Why do you think it was funny? And Seth Rogen says, um, I actually strongly feel that violence against Jews is a terrible problem. I also feel that diminishing violence leads to more violence. And to that end, comparing fart jokes to the pogroms is not helpful for violence against Jews. Now that is the evolution of Seth Rogen. And I do appreciate this evolution where he was endorsing basically Israel's war with Gaza in 2014. And now he's doing good work, especially on social media, calling out these bad faith right-wing Zionists who are basically trying to conflate criticism with the Israeli state's actions to hatred against Jewish people. And again, he's concerned as a Jewish person that downplaying pogroms by saying fart jokes are online pogroms is really not helping. And like I said, what it's doing is just downplaying 
this awful, awful violence. Now, the good thing with this, I think it even shows among Jewish communities, they're waking up a bit more about Israel's actions. Now, these people, you know, might still agree with the state of Israel existing. These people might still be supporters of Israel. But it's important that people who grow up in this Jewish culture like Seth Rogen, where there is a massive emphasis on promoting and whitewashing Israel's founding and settler colonialism, it's important people like this are finally you know, waking up and speaking out. Because these are the people you kind of want to lead the conversation in those communities because they have a, you know, a better chance at changing minds because they both understand and they care about real, awful anti-Semitism, which Jewish people have experienced basically since they were kicked out of the Middle East after the Roman conquest of Jerusalem and burning down the Second Temple. And like I said, pogroms even after the Holocaust occurred. The Jews have had an awful, awful history of anti-Semitism. And like he said, it does not help to then basically do Israeli propaganda, go on far right, you know, outlets or news shows. And that's the problem as well. And because in America, the far right love Israel because they believe it's key to Armageddon, this is why they're willing to platform people like Eve Fartlow because she will help this pro-Israeli agenda, which is actually really sinister because a lot of the pro-Israeli sentiment on the American right is inherently anti-Semitic because they believe it's key to Armageddon. Armageddon, where Jews will either have to convert or be killed with the rest of the non-believers. And if you really care about anti-Semitism, you shouldn't be tweeting out spectator links. You shouldn't be going on Fox News to prop up this like Trumpian pro-Israeli agenda, which really does not care about hate against Jewish people. Now, criticism with Seth Rogen is I could not find any support for the Palestinians on his page. Could not find him talk much about Israel in general over the last couple of months. But I guess I'll take what I can get with someone who supported the 2014 invasion and is then you know, doing good work to counteract these narratives that people are trying to build during Israel's brutal occupation of this territory, especially over the last couple of months. And just like Natalie Portman, who is basically like still a Zionist, but is a more liberal Zionist, who's willing to call out Israel's racism, is willing to call out Israel's you know, problematic aspects. I'll happily engage with dialogue and take that because it's way better to engage with people who at least can see the reality, even if they are like, you know, Natalie Portman's case, a proud Israeli, or Seth Rogen's case, a proud Jewish man and stuff. Because again, that is just better to engage in this dialogue where we can come to some sort of understanding rather than engage with people like Eve Fartlow, who are basically saying that because she has such awful takes on social media and she's getting ratioed, that is somehow some sort of pogrom against her trying to erase her identity. And she just seems to be hurt by lots of her friends probably unfollowing her because it just seems so bitter in her writings. Anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. If you want to follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram, come join our communities on Reddit and Discord. If you want to support my work, check out my Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you all for watching.